So welcome to the very last session of the conference. So we have three papers in the session, and the first one is on inter integral cryptanalysis using algebraic transition matrices. The paper is by Tim Bain and Michel Verbovete, and Michel will give the talk. Uh, thank you, Anne, for the introduction. So yeah, in this work, uh, Tim and I try to fit integral cryptanalysis in the algebraic or the geometric approach, and then we kind of explore the consequences of our actions. Um, I will go through the same motions in this presentation, but before I can do that, I will give you some background on integral cryptanalysis and on the geometric approach. So uh, what is integral cryptanalysis? Um, well, in integral cryptanalysis, we try to find integral properties, which we can use as a distinguishing property of uh, a primitive. So an integral property is defined by two things, some reduction function of every kind of ciphertext, well, that we then sum over and an input set that we want to encrypt. Um, usually in the literature, this reduction function simply consists of picking out one of the output bits of your encryption algorithm. Uh, and so most of the focus has been on choosing this input set so you can get some property that is independent of whatever key uh, you have. So. I give a small timeline here of one of the of the most important things that have happened in integral cryptanalysis. Uh, and there is this clear uh, movement. Uh, originally, integral cryptanalysis was purely purely a structural attack where you try to saturate some like sub sub uh, permutations of your primitive. Um, but slowly, uh, things like the degree and the algebraic normal form or the polynomial representation of your components of the primitive were taken into account um, until finally with something like the monomial prediction, you get a method where you just try to predict the presence of uh, monomials in the algebraic normal form of your primitive and then use it to, cons to build some input set. But in the end, all of this is basically the same. They use one identity, um, this one here in the middle, uh, that basically says if you have some precursor set, which is like all the elements smaller than some bit vector, if you use the partial ordering on these bit vectors, um, if you sum over all these and you evaluate them on some monomial, then this sum will be one, even only if the exponent in your monomial and the dominating vector of your precursor set are the same. I remember this for later. We will come back to this, but before that, something about the geometric approach. So in the geometric approach, one of the most important objects we study is the transition matrices or are the transition matrices of functions. Um, a, this transition matrix is a linear operator that is defined as mapping the Kronecker delta of some input value to the Kronecker delta of the evaluation of that input value on the function. And since it's a linear operator, we can basically propagate forward any function uh, of on the inputs to some function on the outputs. And the reason this is interesting is because by looking at the transition matrix in different uh, coordinate systems, we can actually derive different ways of doing cryptanalysis. For example, linear cryptanalysis is basically uh, the analysis of the transition matrix in the additive character basis. Something similar you can do for differential cryptanalysis with the quasi-differential matrix. And um, doing it like this gives you kind of a complete characterization of your uh, uh, analysis technique. And it has some neat properties. For every transition matrix, it kind of holds that if you have a composition of functions, then the transition matrix of this composition is actually equal to the product of the transition matrices of every one of these functions, and then you can start to decompose this product into a sum of the correlation of trails. So here I wrote this down for the correlation matrix because this is, I think, what most people are familiar with, but you could technically do this for any, uh, for the transition matrix in any uh, coordinate system. So about algebraic transition matrices then, uh, we want to find the basis in which it's, it's natural to describe integral cryptanalysis. And um, this identity I showed earlier actually um, is 
like the bi shows the bi orthogonality of a basis and its dual basis. Uh, and this, in this case, we have like the indicator sets of or the indicator vectors of a precursor set and uh, monomials. So these are like two different bases we can choose. And it happens uh, to be the case that by choosing the precursor basis, we get uh, integral crypt analysis, basically. Uh, this results uh, in the algebraic transition matrix, and it can be easily computed because the change of basis transformation has a really simple structure, which is just the tensor product of this upper triangle matrix. Now, what does such an algebraic transition matrix look like? Well, I have an example here for you. So this is a simple vectorial Boolean function. And every row in the transition matrix or in the algebraic transition matrix actually corresponds to the algebraic normal form of one of the component functions or of the product of component functions of your primitive. So for example, the first row will always be a one followed by zeros because the product of no component functions is just the constant function. And then you get the algebraic normal form for the first component function, the one for the second, and then for the product of the two. Uh, then for some terminology, so we have this matrix product here again that you can decompose in trails and we call them algebraic trails. The individual elements in the trail are exponents and then you have this correlation. In a way, describing it like this, uh, integral cryptanalysis becomes very similar to, for example, linear cryptanalysis. Only one important difference, this correlation will always be, will, will be an element over the field of two elements, so over F2. Uh, which is different from like the real values you usually give to correlations. Um, these algebraic trails are actually related to existing things in the integral crypt analysis literature. So this constructing these trails forwards actually is very similar to uh, parity set propagation because uh, a trail that has correlation well, one will actually correspond to the exact propagation rules for parity sets. And in the other direction, all the uh, all the trails or all, all the algebraic trails with correlation one correspond exactly to the monomial trails used in the monomial trail method. Uh, so yeah, there are a lot of things we can like use or analyze in this new setting, but one of the most interesting things is the key addition. So the key addition has a very simple structure in uh, as an algebraic transition matrix. It's the tensor product of these lower triangular two by two matrices. And uh, this structure actually implies that, for example, the weight of your exponent can never go down uh, when you're doing a key addition. Additionally, if you model the key additions as a separate component in your uh, primitive, then you will all your trails will actually be either zero or some monomial of the key which is a really simple way to describe the correlation. Um, additionally, this key addition can actually help in, or, or can actually guide in the search for integral properties, because um, if some uh, element in the algebraic transition matrix of the composition of your function with like a key addition before and after it is non-zero for any key, then you actually have key dependence for a large part of all the elements in your algebraic transition matrix. Uh, so you won't be able to find any properties there. Speaking about finding properties, how would we go about doing this uh, with this new uh, geometric approach? Well, first we will look at kind of simple properties. Those are properties that directly correspond to elements of the algebraic transition matrix. And we can do as we're used to with something like linear crypt analysis, where we want to find a zero correlation. We just say, well, we proved that all the trails from exponent u to exponent v are zero correlation. This corresponds to parity sets, to monomial trails, to division property. It's practically the same. Uh, a second method we could do that has also been discussed in the monomial prediction paper is you could try to prove that all the trails are actually just independent of the key. So then you know that the uh, sum or your property will always evaluate to something constant, uh, independent of the key, of course. Uh, but a third thing, that the key addition suggests is that we can sort our trails per like uh, correlation or per key monomial and then just sum over these. So if you have an odd number of trails with the same e dependent correlation, then you know for sure that your property will be key dependent and it's kind of useless. Uh, so that's for the simple properties. 
then we also want to maybe find like more complex properties. Maybe there are some specific input sets which are not necessarily a precursor set, which might give us better properties. We can also look at more complex outputs, uh, like reduction functions of the output. So um, this more general property can be expressed using the algebraic transition matrix, but you have here this uh, change of basis transformations, uh, which I will quickly simplify down. So this actually corresponds to the indicator set of your parity set, and this corresponds to the algebraic normal form of your reduction function. Um, so the problem here if, is, in general, if you want to solve this, we will be solving a quadratic uh, equation, and that's kind of annoying. So what we would rather do is solve some kind of linear problem. So we can do a linearization. So uh, in a sense that we get the dot product between the vectorization of your uh, algebraic transition matrix and then the tensor product of your input set and output set transformations. Then if we just kind of ignore the fact that this is a tensor product, we get a linear equation, um, which we can use to find like more general integral properties. Uh, than the ones we're actually searching for, but maybe this is not that bad because, I mean, you could still exploit them. So what you would then do is then for every key, you get one of these factorizations, and then you can construct a matrix. I don't know if this is working, but you can construct this matrix, and then um, if you compute its kernel or its null space, you get basically all the properties. This, actually, this has a really interesting implication, and that is that you would you always expect to find these kind of properties if the key space is smaller than the sizes of the uh, than the products of the sizes of the input and output spaces. Um, but all in all, this is kind of just a theoretical way to describe this because we can never compute it. It's way too large, uh, kind of unusable. So we need to find a way to find a kind of find a useful subspace of the kernel of this matrix. So we developed such a method. Um, I give a kind of simplified uh, explanation here where we just fix the output function. But in essence, everything stays the same. So let's say we fix this output function, then we can describe properties as an in product between uh, a row of the matrix and the indicator set of the parity set, uh, indicator vector of the parity set. Um, and then what we can do is we can kind of split this up into two parts. We have uh, the composition of function f1 and the composition of function f2. And then we just kind of approximate, approximately compute uh, the support of this function. Uh, and then we kind of project on that support. So that would mean that, um, so we project on the support. And that means that if we kind of find um, the uh, kernel of this more, this derived matrix, we will also always have like a null. Uh, this will also always evaluate to null in this case. And then the second thing we can, can do to further simplify computation is we choose some smaller subspace of sets that we want to search in. Um, we can be guided by, for example, the simplifications that the key addition provides to find a way uh, to find some subsets such as that this is key independent, and then we can just compute the kernel of this matrix and get a large set of properties. Um, for example, we uh, performed this on present, well, with some extra additional things so that we can actually find kind of key independent properties, not necessarily properties that are zero. Um, so I brought some examples here. So for example, uh, present on nine rounds has an integral property with two to the 60 data where a single bit kind of sums to zero modulo two. What we show is that for the same input set, there is actually a sum of two bits that is also always constant independent of the key. Uh, another thing that's kind of cool that we can describe are properties where we say, well, we have one simple integral property and another. We don't know in which way they're key dependent, but we actually know that their key dependence is the same. So the sum of the two will always be uh, some kind of constant. And then the last thing um, that might be interesting is we found a property for some input set where the last S box, like in the last round, the rightmost S box, every output value, uh, um, you get every output value with the same parity. So that's also an interesting property. Um, so 
there is one more thing. We kind of made an arbitrary choice of basis uh, based on this identity that coincides with intercore crypt analysis. But this identity kind of suggests that we can also choose this other matrix, uh, this other basis, and get a different matrix that can also be used to do intercore analysis. Um, and so we just, uh, went through this a bit further. And we show that in some ways, this is always related to the algebraic transition matrix or the uh, like algebraic transition matrix of the inverse of the function. Uh, so there is a lot we can learn from this. But one of the most interesting things is that, uh, well, you can, for example, find different properties on in, in like trail-based approaches with all these, uh, with the, all the four different matrices. But if you have a key addition before and after every component, which is kind of an assumption that's made in, for example, bit-based dividend property, then all the four matrices will give uh, or will get the same trails. Uh, so you can't get that much extra information. OK, so in conclusion, uh, we have fit integral crypt analysis into the geometric approach. And this has helped us to better understand integral crypt analysis and what is going on. And we use this to uh, improve on search methods. Uh, but this is not the be-all, end-all of integral crypt analysis, of course. There's still a lot of work. Um, if we really want to push integral crypt analysis, it might be interesting to just stop ignoring the, the, the key in ciphers um, and start either searching for wiki properties or taking into account like the key schedule. Uh, and you can also still improve on the search methods I've described, either by uh, building key recovery methods on it, where you select like the most interesting properties, or you can allow some key computation uh, in this method. Then before I will let you ask questions, one more thing. So everything I've described here is actually just a special case of ultrametric integral crypt analysis, uh, which will be coming soon, uh, and where we actually can describe properties that are not just zero modulo two, but zero modulo some power of two. Okay, thank you for your uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you. Any questions to Michael? Okay, I've got a question. Oh, sorry. I have a question. Uh, did you think of some good candidates or some good round functions that uh, for which this uh, algebraic transition matrix? Will simplifies and then uh, it could be used because uh, otherwise it's very large. So are there some cases for which we could, or, or maybe, well. Um, so one thing, and that, that's what we explore later in ultramatic crypt analysis, is kind of if your uh, transition can be explained with a lot of multiplications or, or if your function contains a lot of multiplications, this really simplifies down. Um, the transition matrix. So that's kind of the the main thing, I think. Uh, oh. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Thank you, Mr. Michel, for the very nice talk. It's a very cool idea. Uh, uh, with the existing methods like monomial prediction or division property, if you want to find uh, integral distinguisher, it's very hard to check nonlinear combination of output bits or even linear combination of them. So we just check input output uh, mask with having weight of one, mm -hmm. right? This is uh, what we do with existing methods. How easy is with your method if you want to like uh, check if a linear combination of output bits has a key independent property or not? I mean, efficiently checking like a lot of combinations. Yeah. So. Because we have these transition matrices, we can just apply linear uh, linear algebra, right? So if we just describe a basis in which we want to find everything, for example, you could say we take all the um, output bits as f functions of our basis. So in this um, like subspace, you would get all the linear combinations of uh, bits, right? Uh, and so what you can just do is because we do this kernel computation you would immediately get all the linear functions out of that. Uh, and only one, like one execution of your so tool? The, the tool, yeah. So it's one execution, but in the background, you would have to do 
around like for every output bit, you would have to do at least one uh, call to some set solver. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Any other question? Yes, Shivan. Uh, I just want to add with Hossein that um, if you have this uh, transition matrix, I think transpose of this matrix with a specific vector will give you the linear combination, right? Um, wait, can you repeat that? Yeah, if you transpose this matrix, then you yes. will get all the columns corresponding to this F1, F2, and all these things. Yeah. So if you just multiply a specific vector with this matrix, you yeah, get yeah. the linear Yeah, that's true. So that's what we yeah. explored. Any other question? Okay, if not, let's thank Michel again. So the next talk is on practical related key forgery attacks on full round tiny jambu. So this is a paper by Oro Dunkelman, Shibam Ghosh, and Eran Nomboy. And Eran will give the talk. Thank you, Anne, for the introduction. Um, yes. So for who doesn't know, Tiny Jambu is one of the NIST lightweight crypto finalists. Um, it's a, wait, it's also here. Uh, so what I said, it's a, one of the finalists of the NIST lightweight competition. Uh, it's a duplex construction with a 128-bit state and a 32-bit rate. It's quite lightweight. It's based on a NLFSR. And we have three versions with the 128, 192, and 256-bit key. And we attack the, the 192 and a 256-bit key variants. Um, it's uh, guarantees a 64-bit uh, authentication security, um, which is not true, as I will show later. And you can use at most two to the 50 bytes of message, and we use a lot less than that. Okay, so first the results. We have a related key differential from the initialization, uh, initialization to the first output, and I'll show later why this is important. Uh, of 2 to the minus 32 for tiny jumbo 256, and with a probability of 2 to the minus 40 for tiny jumbo 192. It's actually quite funny that the 192 bit version is uh, stronger than the 256 bit version. For the 128 bit version, we can't do the uh, the same trick we do for the bigger key uh, versions, um, but that's a technicality. Uh, of the differential. Um, so using this differential, we can uh, get a practical forgery attack of two to the 32 plus two to the 24 data using two to the 10 related key pairs. Now this two to the 10 related key pairs, it's a bit of a technicality, but I'll discuss that later, what the implication of that is for the tiny jumbo 256 and for 92, it's 2 to the 40 plus 2 to the 30 data with 2 to the 12 related key pairs. Um, in the presentation, I will discuss the 256-bit version because it's cleaner and easier to understand. The 192 is exactly the same, but there is a bit more technicality in that involved. Uh, but it's, of course, uh, described in the paper. Um, one interesting thing is that it also shows that tiny jumbo is non-key committing. I think um, at Frisia Crypts, last Frisia Crypts, the key committing thing became, uh, people started looking at it and we discussed that it wasn't key committing. So how does the permutation look like? I'll first discuss the, the internal permutation that we use and then we'll look at the mode. Because of course it's uh, authenticated encryption, so this permutation is used in a mode. Now the top register is the key register, so we load the key into this register, and the lower register is a state. The state is 128 bits long, and the key is 256 bit 
long for our tick. And now what we do is we set the red bits or the the bits with the for the colorblind people the the colored bits. Uh, we set them to one the difference. And using this key difference, we'll see that we'll end up in a zero state with uh, zero state difference. So after one round, you can see that this difference clocked into the most significant bit of the state. And the idea here is that at each of the um, tabs where we have XOR, we want to cancel the difference. So we won't introduce any new dif uh, differences into the state. So after 37 rounds, we'll cancel the state difference with the key difference and we don't introduce a state, then we'll see an end and it will not produce a difference with probability half. Um, then we get another end. Also with prob uh, probability half, we won't get a difference, a new difference in the state. And then we continue uh, canceling the differences until after 128 uh, clocks of the NLFSR, we get a zero, oh, a zero difference in the state and this difference in the key register. Now, the next rounds until the 256th round, uh, yeah, we started at zero. Um, we have no difference in the state and we'll end up where we started, which is nice because now we can concatenate them and we'll continue through the cipher. Now, for the 256-bit version, we have two permutations, two sizes of permutations in the mode. The one uh, A is has 1,280 rounds, so that's basically 10 clocks of the state, uh, 10 times uh, 128, so five times what we saw before, and 640 um, rounds, which is two and a half times what we saw before. So you go through the whole key two and a half times or five times. And this is important, like we will see uh, when we look at the mode. Okay, so let's have a look at the initialization. And our goal is to end up here with a zero difference in the state. Now, as we see, we start with a PB, which is uh, 640 uh, blocks. Now, we can also see that after the first PB, there is no uh, addition of any uh, attacker controlled variable. So if there is a difference there, we, we lose. Like we cannot cancel it. So we, we have to go, uh, so the, the difference propagates and it won't work. Now, after PA, we see that we can add a nonce in the most significant 32 bits, because each of uh, this, this part is 32 bits. So if there is a difference there, we can cancel it. Now let's go back a bit. And we see that um, after 128 rounds, so that's half, a full key cycle, we have a zero difference. Um, yes, but after 127, so this is the 128 round, we have a difference in the least significant bit, which we cannot cancel. So if you remember, we had two and a half key cycles. So we'll end up with, uh, after 640 rounds, we'll end up with a um, a difference bit in the least significant bit that we cannot cancel after PB. Now to solve this, we can just take the initial uh, difference and shift it by 127 bits. And now we'll get a zero difference after PB, but we'll get the one difference in the most significant bit of the state after PA. Okay. So now we apply, we start with the zero state 
and we apply PB, we get a zero difference and we with a probability two to the minus four. And if you apply PA, we get a one a bit difference in the most significant bit with probability two to the minus 10. And this difference we can cancel with the first nonce, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So after three PAs, we get um, a zero difference in the state with uh, probability two to the minus 32. Okay. So now let's say that this happened and we end up with a zero difference here, then um, we can see that after one more PB, we can observe the output. So this is the first time in the whole mode that we can start observing the output. And we can now say if the initialization led to a zero difference in the state or not. So we can start pruning here. That's why it's important to first know uh, the initialization, why the initialization is so. Now from here on, it's quite straightforward we, because we uh, can take one message block, run one PB, and then we start extracting the, uh, the tag. Now here, it's actually interesting again, because we see that we have one PB, which will give us a zero, different state with some probability. And then afterwards we have a PA for which we said that we'll get the one difference. But the one difference is in the most significant bit. And we're tapping from the 32 bits below that. And those are still zero. So it's high probability we'll still get a zero difference in this stack. So now the whole attack is um, here, so in after two to the uh, we need two to the thirty two data to get to the initialization, uh, get through the initialization until we can observe it, and then uh, we need two to the ten data to get a nonce that um, that has a zero difference. So basically, we'll get a forgery. So what I said before, we have a slight technicality because. As we can see in the initialization, until we add the nonce, there are two permutation calls that we cannot influence. The only influence there is the key. So we need uh, quite some related key pairs such that we find in the end a pair that, that has this property. Uh, now each key because we can put the uh, uh, the difference in the most uh, 32 most significant bits each key has 32 uh, um, keys that it can pair with to get this uh, uh, characteristic and uh, so we need um, two to the 10 related keys or two to the 10 keys that have some relation now, of course, because the running time is quite low, we have a practical result. Here you can see that we have some difference in the key and some difference in the nonce. We don't need a difference or we can't introduce a difference in the message. And then the ciphertext and the tag don't have a difference either. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot. Any question? Or comment? Could you avoid this attack by adding some key schedule somewhere? Yes. yes. So that's basically the problem here that there's no key schedule. Yeah. So if you add some kind of key schedule, the attack won't work. Even if you just take the uh, the 32, yeah, it doesn't work with the proof, but the last tag is extracted in an unfortunate place. Yeah. Like if you would swap them around or something, but you have to check with the secured proof that works. But the key schedule will solve it. OK, so you don't need to increase the size of the internal state. No. Yes, Question, yes. 
Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I like the idea of uh, applying the talk to the key to break key key commitment. Mm -hmm. I think in the key commitment setting, you can choose the value of the keys, or you can choose values of nonce so that the uh, part of the definition trail mm -hmm. is satisfied. So, so I think the talk is practical, but uh, you can even improve the talk by using those. Yeah. So in the key commit in the key committing setting, it's uh, way more powerful. Okay. I think, but I mean, you, you. So, did you try to optimize the talk for that? No, thing? because we, the the paper was finished by the time that uh -huh. key committing was a thing. So, okay, so it's so just an addendum to the slides. <laughs> okay, thank you. Now, Shibam, please take the microphone. Basically, we knew for uh, about the key commitment from reviewers' comment. We had no idea there is a thing called key commitment. So, yeah. Any other question or comment? Okay, if not, let's thank Aaron again. So we now move to the last talk of the conference, which is on stream ciphers. So the talk is entitled Improved Fast Correlation Attacks on the Sosimanuk Stream Cipher. The author of the paper are, are Bin Zhang, Riatol Liu, Tianjin Gong, and Lin Jiao. And Bin Zhang is giving the talk. Uh, thanks for the introduction. The title of my talk is Improved Fast Correlation Attacks on the Sosimanuk Cipher. This is a joint work with Riatol Liu, Tianjin Gong, and Jiaolin. Uh, my talk consists of uh, these uh, five parts. Uh, first, uh, we will give some motivation and uh, 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 give some the, uh, the instruction for contribution. And then we will give some background on the correlation and the linear crime analysis and the solving erosion. And uh, we give the new algorithm procedures and uh, we applicate, we make the application to source menu. And finally, we give the conference. Uh, the European Stream Project. We yeah. uh, the European Stream Project, uh, which is a multi year effort running from 2004. No. Okay. Mm. Which is a multi-year effort for running from 2004 to 2008. Uh, this uh, has a sustaining effect on the design and analysis of modern stream ciphers, uh, which provides some typical design paradigms. For example, we have the nonlinear feedback shift register based design. Uh, the representatives are um, Groovy One and Trivial. And we also have the ARX based design, for example, it is uh, Celsa and the Rabbit. And uh, we also have the linear feedback shift register plus finished machine design, uh, which is the source menu. Uh, this uh, cipher combines Snow 2 uh, with Serpent Block Cipher. There is a 4 bit S box from Serpent Block Cipher. And uh, we all know that. As a conclusion from the Eastern Final Report on Source Manual is that it offers a very considerable security margin as well as reasonable performance trade-offs. Uh, correlation attack is a classical cryptanalysis method for linear, feed, uh, linear feedback shift register-based stream ciphers, uh, which exploits the statistical relation between the key stream and the, a subset of linear feedback shift register uh, uh, sequences. A fast correlation attack speeds up the, um, the exhaustive search of the involved linear feedback shift register state by some decoding algorithms from coding theory. A source menu follows the linear feedback sh shift register plus finished state machine design strategy of the Snow family of stream ciphers. Thus, this is a natural target to try fast correlation attacks. Uh, so far, there are huge efforts made to cryptanalysis source manual since 2004. Uh, for example, we have several guess and determinant attacks 
and the time memory data trade-off attacks and the correlation attacks and the linear cryptanalysis. So there are almost uh, 20 years of work on this cipher. Mm. Uh, one given the correlation of the found linear approximation, which is uh, two half plus uh, two, two minus 20, 20, uh, 21.41, and the number of binary variables, which is 320, the information theoretical bound of the complexity for any attack aiming at the 320 bit entropy in the MFSI initial state is this value, which is uh, 2251.08. And here, HX is a binary entropy function. So we can see that there is a, a huge gap between the theoretical value and the cryptanalysis practice on this cipher with 2154. Uh, uh, this gap is huge. And a natural question is whether we could narrow this gap by some improved decoding algorithms given the same correlation. All contributions. Uh, we first uh, we present a new uh, improved algorithm for fast correlation attacks on stream ciphers, and with uh, some new algorithm procedures. Uh, what are they precisely? We make the distribution transformation convert the distribution of the linear feedback shift initial state from uniform to the same BIOS distribution as that of the found uh, linear approximation by Gauss elimination, together with the BKW collision reduction to substitute the previous algorithm based on generalized birthday problem and the code reduction to reduce the secret dimension. Uh, we study the security of source manual by the newly developed algorithm we launch a new state recovery attack with a time complexity of around uh, two to one hundred thirteen four point eight, uh, which is about uh, uh, two to twenty times faster than the best previous results at Asia Crew two thousand eight, and also the fastest attack among all known attacks on source menu known so far. Okay, we look at some preliminar preliminaries. So we look at the definition of the linear codes. Uh, we all know that. Uh, NKD, linear code C over GF2. Uh, this is a subspace with dimension K of the vector space of uh, N bit length. And N is the code word length, and K is the dimension of uh, information base. And D is the minimum distance between any two code words, or the minimum weight of a non zero code word in C. Sometimes we refer to NK linear code for simplicity. And with this definition, we can rewrite the, we can represent the linear code as the uh, multiplication of uh, information vector M, which uh, is a uh, K dimension, and uh, with the uh, uh, generator matrix as this. Correlation attacks usually exploit the correlation between the key stream and the linear, co linear combination of several linear feedback shift register sequences. The core problem is regarded as the decoding of a low rate linear block code transmitted uh, through uh, Binary channel usually symmetric, as depicted in the figure here, so that uh, we have the linear feedback shift register output. But this is disturbed by some noise. And this noise represents nonlinearity introduced by the cipher, and we can see the output uh, of Z. And the task of the cryptanalysis is to re recover this part from Z. Uh, the starting point is to look at the generator matrix G of the linear feedback shift register NK linear code, where N is the length of the code word and K is the dimension of the information. Uh, that is a linear feedback shift length. And uh, we have this representation, and uh, this we uh, represent the linear feedback shift, shift register output sequence as a code word uh, in the in this in this code. And then we prepare the parity check uh, equations. We regard the column uh, vectors as random vectors over this uh, uh, dimension. <clears throat> we construct the parity checks uh, as here. That is, uh, we just uh, uh, try to find the some tuple, uh, some v tuple of uh, the column vectors so that it vanish on the on the remaining base only uh, re remain a part of the information base. Know that this uh, procedure is similar to the BKW collision in European solvers, and the new noise uh, has been folded to this level uh, with the original noise here. 
And uh, we also know that the linear criminalysis is a known plain text attack proposed by Matsui in 1993 to break DES, uh, which can be seen as a more generic and uh, closely related method to correlation attacks in symmetric key cryptanalysis. Uh, in linear cryptanalysis, we first look for bitwise linear approximations of the nonlinear components with a deviation uh, from one half as much as possible and connect them together to build some probabilistic linear equations between several input and, and output bits and uh, the, key stream, uh, the key material. Uh, actually, the key recovery routine in linear cryptanalysis is unnecessarily to be confined to the above algorithm routine. In general, we can lose the restrictions and to establish a, a probabilistic linear system with the involved TS variables. And uh, we look at the carbon code definition. So we have two uh, uh, two linear codes. One is C1, and the other is C2 with this uh, uh, code uh, attribute parameters. And uh, the direct sum of C1 and C2 is derived as here. And uh, we can see that the direct sum of C1 and C2 is a new linear code with uh, this uh, radius and the code length and the information dimension. From this definition, the direct sum of two known codes is a new linear code constructed by concatenation whose basic coding attribute can be determined accordingly. Also, uh, for some code C, we, we call it a carbon code if uh, each vector in the vector space is within a fixed distance to the sum code in C. Uh, the technique of uh, carbon code plays an important role uh, in cryptographic uh, hash function domain for mirrorless near collision detecting and for solving LPN, whose definition is as follows. The LPN problem is be believed to be hard even given quantum computers, though no, fo no formal reduction from hard lattice problems exist, unlike the case of learning with errors problem. The search LPN problem is uh, uh, given as follows. This is some informal, but uh, we catch the nature. For a secret uh, vector S, which is the K dimension, the adversary is given many pairs of this form. That is, uh, this is a uh, G is uh, a random vector of the same direction. And we have the noise disturbed output of the inner product uh, between G and S. And uh, the noise uh, variable E here follows the Bernoulli distribution with the parameter uh, eta. The task of the adversary is to recover as uh, from the many given pairs. We can see that fast collision attacks, linear criminalists, and the European solvers share the same mathematic model. And thus, we could consider and employ the, the links to get improved results. <laughs> we first look at the first algorithm procedure introduced in fast collision attack. Uh, this is a Gauss elimination. As in European solvers, Gauss elimination can be adopted here to transform the distribution of the secret variables into the same distribution as that of the noise variable. That is, we make a systemization of this matrix. Uh, and the BKW collision reduction is <coughs> shown in this uh, uh, algorithm. Actually, we have the generator matrix at the beginning uh, here, and some parameters T and B. <coughs> we make some uh, reduction uh, on this matrix as follows. So there is a loop of uh, T iterations. In each iteration, we partition the columns of the original input matrix according to the last uh, B times I Bs. And uh, we form pairs of the columns in each partition to obtain a new matrix. Uh, there are two strategies here. One is RF1 uh, from uh, everyone is uh, that uh, we choose a representative in each partition and then we XOR this representative to uh, everyone else in the same partition to get a new element to cancel the last uh, BBs. And uh, there are the strategies ever too. Um, this uh, strategy is that we, instead of consider uh, selecting a representative, we just uh, for each pair, for each combination of two different uh, uh, columns in this uh, same partition, we X all them together and then we put the result to the uh, new matrix and then we make a T iterations here. Then finally, we can get a new uh, matrix GT. Uh, this uh, new matrix uh, different has some difference from the original input matrix. That is, we have canceled out uh, the last B times I Bs. 
and we look at another uh, algorithm procedure introduced uh, is a uh, code induction, uh, which introduce uh, reduce the dimension of the secret information without having the piling up lam uh, lamma penalty of the faultiness, uh, faulty noise, uh, precisely uh, with the output of the uh, the um, BKW collision reduction, we have this uh, matrix uh, so that uh, we can rewrite each uh, um, column here uh, as some uh, sum of the uh, code word from some linear code and the noise vector. And then we can um, make this uh, substitute this representation into the original equation. We can get uh, the new representation of the keystream base. And uh, we look for some t turbo column vectors such that the XO of them have some the special structure here. And uh, here the star means uh, the uh, arbitrary value in GF2, and the K1 is less than this value. Accordingly, we can make the substitution uh, with, the, uh, with the key stream uh, variables, and uh, we can get this equation here. And uh, to simplify the notification uh, no, no, notations, we let uh, the ZI prime to represent this uh, uh, this equation, and the GI prime to represent the XOR sum of the of the T column uh, vectors, and the truncated the K times one column vector, uh, the new noise variable EI prime is defined here, so that we have a new uh, formulation of the problem as here. We can see that the uh, uh, form is uh, similar to the original one, but it has uh, reduced uh, the dimension. And uh, what, what we call code direction is that we want to construct a new linear code uh, with the uh, code word length k1 and the dimension, information dimension length kc and uh, with the current radius, uh, radius dc to regroup the columns in the matrix g prime. Uh, that is, we express is a uh, column vectors as this form, where uh, the ci uh, is the nearest uh, code word to the random column vector g prime. And uh, it is well known that there are only very limited type of perfect codes in binary domain, uh, which is li uh, listed uh, in this domain. It's a Hamming code, repetition code, and the Golly code, and the uh, zero code, and the original one. And uh, this algorithm we introduced to compute the uh, uh, each uh, T a coordinate distribution of the perfect codes. Uh, this is the computing result uh, that is for the Hamming code. Uh, the error probability of each coordinate is here. And for the Golly code, it's this value. And for the repetition code, it's uh, here. Then we make uh, the, uh, we want to find the optimal configuration of the direct sum. And we translate it into uh, uh, the, the mixed uh, uh, integer program as, as here. The first uh, constraint is uh, on the code word length, and this is on the information base. So this is a new framework of, for the improved fast correlation attack. Uh, here we just introduced the dimension strategy from the above, and then we build a new linear code accordingly. And then finally, we make the fast uh, version Hadamard transform to decode the new code. We recover the partial state. And this is the uh, complexity of the new algorithm. We will not go into the details. And uh, now we look at source manual. So source manual is stream server, which consists of a linear feedback shifter part and the finished state machine part. Uh, the difference from Snow family of stream server is that here it has a sub four bit uh, S box, a serpent one, and here it has a, a multiplexer chosen according to the last uh, the this second bit of R one. Uh, this uh, will make some linear approximation of this cipher. And finally, we find that when the linear marks this value, we have uh, the best found the linear approximation of the bells, uh, 2 to minus 21.41. Uh, uh, this is the linear approximation. And uh, we adopt uh, some table-based strategy to save the sums of the columns to, um, to avoid the previous large uh, table problem. And uh, we uh, divide each... Uh, uh, n dimensional XOR into some smaller dimensions and only store the table of all possible XORs of the smaller dimensional and we read it several times. And uh, we construct the linear code of this dimension. That is, uh, it's a direct uh, sum of two 
uh, Hamming told with uh, uh, parameter four and one Hamming told with uh, uh, parameter six and the four Golly code. And then we in compute the bells as here. And finally, the complexity is computed here. Uh, we make some conclusions. We present a new framework for fast correlation text on stream ciphers with the new integrated algorithm procedures uh, that is goals elimination, BKW collision reduction, and code reduction. We have got uh, improved cryptanalysis results on source menu with the time consistency uh, here to to 134.8, which is uh, uh, to two times uh, to two 20 times faster than the achievable before by fast correlation text. And there is a fast one well among all known texts here. We also make the experiments on a small scale version of source manual to verify our results and got a confirmed results. Uh, our results uh, indicates that the security margin of source manual is around the uh, 2 to 8 for the 128 bit security for the first time. And uh, this is somewhat contrary to the conclusion of the European Stream final report in 2008. Thank you. Do you have questions? Well, um, I'm wondering because there, there are also many public key systems which are based on the hardness of decoding. Yes. I'm wondering whether your framework could be used to improve some attacks against this code-based system. Uh, Did yes. you have a look at? Uh, not yet, but I, I will consider that for some public key, yes. Yes, for this framework, yeah, yes. Another question? Okay, so maybe a, a, a last question. Yes. Uh, in the case of Soze Manuk, uh, you used only one uh, linear approximation of the S box. Uh, yes, we use only one linear approximation, yes. Couldn't you use several ones uh, together? Uh, yes, actually, we, we are doing on that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, but because th does it change the, the distribution of the noise or? Uh, yes, uh, actually, if we have uh, you, we can if we use multiple linear transformations, we can get somewhat improved results. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. A last question. Okay. If not, let's thank Ben and all the speakers of the session. Thanks. So this ends the technical.